So let's begin with this Bible verse that all of you know about the birth of Jesus. You all know, of course, that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and we want to go to Bethlehem and look at the Church of the Nativity. So I want to tell you a little bit about this church and about what we know or don't know, as the case may be, about some of the holy sites in the Holy Land. You may remember that Emperor Constantine was the first Christian emperor. He was converted to Christianity. And very soon after that, he empowered his wife to send some money and some people to establish the Holy Land. So this is the Church of the Nativity. And there's a phrase that I'm going to use several times this afternoon. And the phrase is, tradition tells us. So about 350 years after the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, some people went to the Holy Lands and they decided this was the place where Jesus was born. There were no maps. There was certainly no eyewitness accounts. So what I want to say is, yeah, this is pretty close. Jerusalem was a small town 2,000 years ago. It is more or less where it was. Was it on this exact spot? I don't know, but it's in the vicinity, and that's why I'm going to use several times this phrase, tradition tells us. This is a church that's sort of a hodgepodge of a building. The first building was put up something like 360. Various buildings were sort of superimposed on top of it. And part of understanding the Holy Lands is understanding what has happened in the Holy Lands over a period of years. One thing is this. In 1562, the Pope gave dominion, so to speak, gave responsibility for care of the holy sites in the Holy Lands to the Franciscan order. So we see Franciscan sites and Franciscan monks and a number of important places in the Holy Land. What you're seeing here is a cross that may look unusual to you. You'll see that it has the four arms of equal length and it has four of these crosses inside it. This is what's called the Crusader's Cross or sometimes the Jerusalem Cross. And this is the cross that we see again and again in the Holy Land. When we go inside the Church of the Nativity, what we see is an Eastern Orthodox Church. And I want to emphasize that point because of the three branches of Christianity, Protestantism, Catholicism, and Eastern Orthodoxy, Eastern Orthodoxy, certainly in Lancaster County, is the least well known. It is a church that emphasizes ritual to a very considerable extent, and therefore the interiors of the churches are very ornate. They have what are called these icon walls up here. There are these very heavy chandeliers. You might be interested to know that these silver chandeliers were donated by Emperor Nicholas II, the last Tsar of Russia. There's incense burning, there are candles burning. It's a very lush and overwhelming experience. I mentioned that the first church built on this site was begun in the uh, 360s or thereabouts. This is the original floor right here. This was a section of the original floor done in the florid mosaic Byzantine style that would have been appropriate at the time. Remember, it's a really important thing to understand about the early history of Christianity roughly for the first thousand years after the crucifixion of Christ, the major form of Christianity in what now we think of as the Holy Land and the Middle East, really for that matter, was the Orthodox Church. And therefore, its particular forms of rituals, its particular form of church interiors are the ones that we see. Now here's a verse that I'm sure you all know. It, for me, brings up a memory of being a kid in Christmas pageants, in Christmas. And I remember being in several Christmas pageants and the minister would read this verse of the Bible, there were shepherds keeping watch over their flocks by night. So I was a little kid, I didn't know, and I sat there in the pew thinking, why didn't they just go home and get a good night's sleep like everybody else? Why are they keeping watch over their flocks at night? Anybody else will ever wonder about that? Why do you think the shepherds were keeping watch over their flocks by night? Anybody? They didn't want the animal, the sheep to be stolen, and they wanted to protect them from the wolves, right? So if you were in Bethlehem and you wanted to do this, you wanted to keep watch over your flocks, where would you go? Here's where you'd go. 
The area around Bethlehem is sort of hilly, no mountains, but hills. And since it's dry, you have scrub brush around there. So if you were keeping watch over your flocks by night, here's where you'd be, right up to the top of one of these hills. And that makes sense once we realize, okay, they were at the top of these hills. So it would have been easy for them to see the angel. Remember the angel Lord appeared to them. They could have seen the star of Bethlehem. They could have seen all of these things. And they would have done that from the tops of one of these hills because it's a hilly area. All right. We now are going to follow the ministry of Jesus and look at the places where it took place. The first one, of course, was the baptism of Jesus. And as you all know, he was baptized in the River Jordan. Now, there are a couple of things about this. First of all, it's generally considered to be true that Jesus began baptism as a sacrament that before Jesus, in Jewish tradition, there was no baptism as such. There was ceremonial washing, but no baptism as such. Second, what about the Jordan River? There's an old song called Michael Rutherford or Shore. It has a line in it, River Jordan, Chilly and Wide. Remember that old song? I am here to tell you folks that whoever wrote that song had never seen the River Jordan. It's like 30 feet wide and maybe five feet deep. There's just not enough water in that part of the world to have a river the way we think of it. Now, this is sort of looking from west to east. This is looking from north to south. And when we go down there, we see, yeah, it widens out in some places. What would you say that is? 60 feet wide, 70 feet wide, maybe? Something like that. I don't think it's, you're ever going to be over your head in the water in the river Jordan. Now, to be sure, there is some vegetation along the river because it's the only source of water for an area around there. So if you go out from the river, you see some trees and some bushes. These flowers obviously have been planted, but by and large, there's not much vegetation in this part of the world. So that's one of the things that we want to understand, the geography, the area of the Holy Land. Another part of what we want to understand this afternoon is this. What is the contemporary significance of the Holy Land? What does it mean to people living in the 21st century? And for the River Jordan, of course, the answer is easy. People who can afford it, who have the time, want to go there to be baptized. And in fact, what you see here is this minister who is about to baptize this woman in the River Jordan. Now, you'll notice that these people are wearing white robes. And it's another part of what you want to understand as the meaning of the Holy Land in the 21st century to understand that right next to the River Jordan, there's a big gift shop. And in the gift shop, you can buy robes that people wear, that people consider appropriate for being baptized in the River Jordan. You can also get little bottles of water from the River Jordan that you can take home. A lot of people uh, do that. The whole area, as a matter of fact, along the bank of the River Jordan has been very much built up. There are about 50 of these plaques in all the languages that I could recognize and a whole bunch of languages that I couldn't recognize. And basically, they all say the same thing, that they're dedicated to the Christians who came to the River Jordan to be baptized there as part of their spiritual life. 